then obviously after a long playing career and then a coaching career in county cricket, you've had a few years away from the county setup. Why now the thought that you wanted to come back into county cricket? And I suppose the obvious question from North Africa's point of view, why was this the place you wanted to come to? Well, firstly, yeah, I, I, the amount of time I'd spent playing and then also coaching the back end of that spell at county cricket. Um, I've got a, a massive love of the game and I think that is potentially how I feel is all I know um, within cricket. I've really enjoyed my time in county cricket and then when I stepped away from Leicestershire to become a self-employed consultant, I've had some great times as well. I think for me, I never took my eye off the ball in county cricket while I was a consultant. I always kept an eye on results and what teams were playing and who was playing well and individuals. And I never really felt out of it. Um, and, and then it just came about, I finished the World Cup um, for Cricket Island last September. Um, and then the, uh, the opportunity to interview for this league batting coach came about. And fortunately for me, I'm relatively local, but I've also spent a little bit of time down at the County Brown in the last couple of years with yourself uh, on the comms. And I really enjoy the way Northamptonshire set about playing the game. Um, th th those two things married up with the coaching staff that at the time were here at Northamptonshire and Graham White had just been um, taken on as a, as a fielding coach. Chris Little and John Sadler, it was sort of a time for a new beginning for the club I felt as well with David Ripley stepping away uh, and I wanted to be part of that. We'll talk a little bit about how the, the various coaching roles will, will dovetail in, in a second but the fact that during your county career, not least as a player, you, know, you won the championship with, with Leicestershire um, and you've enjoyed success with both Leicestershire and Worcestershire, uh, to what extent is that going to be able to, to feed in to the, the coaching setup and indeed the whole setup here at, at Northamptonshire, the fact that you actually you know what it takes to win things? Yeah, I think it's a big thing for me uh, and, and it helps me as much as it probably helps those that I'm coaching. I mean, it will do down the line at some stage but it gives me um, a real good sort of like knowledge of what a long county campaign a season can look like. I think first and foremost, um, they're a long campaign and with winter training as well that goes into that and preparing for that is a big, is a massive part of county cricket now. Um, I think for me, it's breaking down the different formats. When we were successful at Leicestershire in the late nineties, there wasn't as much cricket being played. It was all either first class cricket or it was 50 over with a little bit of 40 over cricket as well, which weren't taken too seriously. The county championship was the be all and end all for a professional cricketer to win. Um, and I think what I enjoyed about that was it was a team that wasn't a team with many real sort of like superstars in it. We had an outstanding overseas player in Phil Simmons. Um, but what I learned in that team was it was the cohesion of all the players and how we all dovetailed in, like you mentioned, to have our role in the side. We would often find that some of us would play off against others, especially with the bat. There'd be certain batters that would play in a completely different way and that would be hard to bowl at. And, and likewise, our bowlers were very different. We had left arm around the Malali, David Milnes, who was a seamer that would run him down the hill and bowl good pace. Then we had the all-rounders like Gordon Parsons and Vince Wells and Darren Maddy that would hold the scene together and, and Phil Simmons as well. Um, and it, it was a team that really started to gel because we wanted to actually perform to our best of our own ability to be able to help our teammates and become a successful team, win something. Also, and you touched on this already, you, you've, in terms of what you bring to the, the mix, You've had recent experience of international cricket, and, and not just international cricket, but in terms of actually bringing Ireland through um, to full um, ICC status. Again, I'm assuming that, that you've picked up a lot of tips, wrinkles, and, um, and useful stuff from actually seeing the experience of cricket around the world with Ireland. Because you've been, you've been to some some interesting places in the last two or three years. Yeah, I have. I, I mean, it was a it was. A stroke of luck, really, that I landed on you know Cricket Island's doorstep. I was away in New Zealand at the time, 
um, coaching. I've had three months over there as, a, as an assistant coach for uh, Central Districts and I had a phone call to say, would you be able to go straight from New Zealand to Dubai on a training camp and then from Dubai to India with Cricket Island to play against Afghanistan in a full series? It was John Bracewell, the coach at Cricket Island at the time. Um, and I'd coached at Leicestershire when John was coaching at Gloucestershire and he'd seen my work ethic with the players and thought, ideally, we could get Ben involved. It's another coaching set of hands. But also, again, he wanted me to work quite um, carefully and closely with their batters on playing spin, which was an area of my game that I was probably one of my strongest areas. Um, and it was a start of a journey with Cricket Island that has been a huge part of my coaching career now to date. And it's not just the amount of time I spent with Cricket Island playing cricket and coaching in, in Malahide or in, in Stormont over in Ireland. Um, but also the countries we went to and seeing how the opposition set up and how they prepare and talking to the opposition coaches, just the Pakistan coaches, the Australian, the English, just, just to get a feel of how they go about setting up for a series or they go about preparing their players for, for actual combat in games. Um, so it wasn't just all about what I, the time I spent with cricket on. That was really hard work because in Ireland there isn't a great amount of facility over there. So you have to be quite innovative the way you train over in Ireland. My role specifically was in competition. So I was always involved with Cricket Ireland in match play. So it's moving from one game to the next to the next, which can be quite tricky because you don't have a period of time to train and prepare players for the next game. Um, so it was very quick fix work I did and I was with them for five years, but just I think some of the experiences I had seeing how Mickey Arthur was with Pakistan in that first test match at Malahide, um, to then how Paul Collingwood and Chris Silverwood were the England team when we managed to beat um, England in an ODI down in Southampton two seasons ago. So again, it wasn't just me being involved with Ireland, it was me being involved with Ireland, seeing how we all grew and could grow our games and coaching strategies and being around others. To bring it back to Northamptonshire, um, you mentioned a little bit earlier that, that you and I have shared the commentary box for the last couple of seasons, doing a lot of commentary with, with BBC Radio Northampton and, and uh, with BBC online commentary. Um, how useful has that been? And perhaps when it came to actually interviewing for the Northamptonshire Post, how useful was it to be able to say, yeah, I've actually seen the Northamptonshire batters as a unit, as individuals. I've seen perhaps where they've done well, seen things that perhaps we could improve on. How handy an experience was that? I think it was, it, it has held me in good stead going into the initial um, period of my new role. One thing that John Sadler did, and I think it was, a, it was a stroke of genius, was that my contract didn't start until the 10th of January officially, but he got me in to consult for four sessions with the players during the winter programme before Christmas. Um, so that, was, again, just helped me get into the feel of who I'm working with subtle introductions, not to all the players, because some of them are away. Um, but it, it gave me a, an opportunity to bridge some gaps between starting afresh on the 10th of January or actually knowing a little bit more about the players and who I was working with. And I think that was the same with the, um, with the commentary work I did with yourself. And it, I could see from the commentary box, the talent that the batters showed, even the bowlers. I was looking as a, as a general, um, set of eyes back there. I wasn't actually looking at just becoming a batting coach. Um, and just to see how they set up for cricket, how they set up for games. What really did impress me about the Northamptonshire players in, and in their squad was they did look as though they had a, they enjoyed each other's company. You know, even from warm-ups to some long sessions in the field where you've all got to pull together, it looked as though they were prepared to work for each other and get through those periods which to me is a good sign because I think if how your team are working in the field and in preparation to a game of, often tells you how the team's travelling and the squad overall. I think what is important to stress with this, with this role that you have at North Aperture now, Ben, is it's not just the first team batters that you're working with, it's, it's through the club. So you're going to be working with the first team, you're going to be working presumably with the academy and, and these sort of things. How, how is that going to work? How is, how is that going to spread out over the season? What opportunities will you have realistically given that it's such a, a busy season to actually sit down with some of the age group batters, the academy batters and, 
bring your expertise to bear on them? Yeah, so I think for a start, it's worth sort of understanding that our company mostly heavily involved with the professional squad um, because that we've got the winter program in place for me to do that. Uh, and then the initial period of the season as well. So we get off to a start and I can link my work from the, this winter into early season because it's obviously important that what happens in that first team dressing room, results, performances, attitudes of players gets filtered down through into second team, into academy and then into the pathway age groups. There will be a time where, yes, I'll step to one side and spend some time with the second team and again with the academy and with the age group players. One thing the club has done um, really well, um, they've employed pathway coaches as well. So there's now a lead batting coach, uh, Adil Arif. So I work closely with him. So it might not be that I'm there in person working with the player or with the group of players, but I'm always passing on some information to him and he's feeding information back to me. So we'll keep in touch with each other weekly, daily basis to see how individual players are going and how teams are going um, and we'll link in like that. So that's really good because again, it's bridging gaps. My, I see my role as trying to feed down what the first team and professionals are doing. Can we get the second team players aware of what's required? Can we then get the academy players required of what's needed and, and likewise that way? So the gaps have, have been bridged. So ultimately, Everybody in the pathway understands what the Northamptonshire batters really need to look like. But I thought it was interesting uh, that in, as part of the interview process, you needed to talk about working with an up and coming player, a young batsman. Um, so again, presumably it, it feeds into this, this whole idea of a batting unit right the way throughout the club. Yeah, absolutely. And there will be a time when I spend more time with academy players and obviously, you know, when you start looking at players coming through, it might be more the fringe players. There's a lot, lot of work that has to be done with um, developing players at a younger age. So up to the age of 15, that is very much about nailing the basics. So age groups from 11 up to 15, it's about having really good basic skills involved as a batter. From the ages of 15 up to 17, then it starts becoming more of a mental game. There's more tactics involved. Can that player handle um, environments moving up? You know, better opposition. Um, and then once it gets to the academy stage, can those academy players then start developing skills that are going to hold them in good stead to play in men's cricket at a higher level like second team? Um, and that's when I feel my role will be understanding at first. Northamptonshire as a batting group and what we are looking for and how we want to perform and play under John Sadler, how we play our white ball, how we play our red ball cricket, and then start feeding that down through the through the uh, pathway. To talk about red ball for a second, um, obviously one of the criticisms, and you hear this from supporters just about every county across the country, we're not seeing enough hundreds, we're not seeing enough big hundreds, the daddy hundreds as, as Graham Gooch used to call them. Part of that is, is a, I suspect, technical, but I suspect a big part of that is about mindset and is about the game played in the, in the mind. You scored, what, 40 plus first class hundreds in the course of your career. How easy is it for, for a coach like you to actually sort of get into the head of a batsman and say, this is what you need to do to bat sessions or whatever? Yeah. I think, firstly, it's worth sort of knowing that, noting that the players, when I played in, my era, as it were, um, there wasn't quite the need and the necessity for aggressive uh, batting as such. It was more crease occupation, um, valuing your wicket uh, in all formats, really, until T20 came in 2004, 2005. Um, so there w it was slightly more in favour of the purest, longer version of the game, you know, grind out in innings. Um, and I still think that in red ball cricket, that has a real place. Um, in red ball cricket, it's being able to um, it's being able to trust your defence. It's being able to know where your off stump is. So ultimately, you can deal with the bowler's best ball. 
But alongside that, it's also having the ability to be patient and understand that if you do miss out on the odd shot that doesn't, a bad ball that doesn't go to the boundary, or you don't score off, that isn't an issue. You reset and go again for the next ball. Whereas in the shorter formats of the game now, if you miss out on a bad ball or a ball you should be scoring off, it lumps on massive pressure. So I think it's about the mindset of, I've got a lot more time than I think in red ball cricket as a batsman. And I'm going to look to try and build a score that if I score the majority of my runs at the end of this innings, then so be it. And, and just having trust and faith that your name isn't always on one. You know, I've got to get my runs quickly before I get out. But don't get me wrong, there might be a pitch now and again which you have to be more aggressive on and try and take the, the battle to the opposition, reverse the pressure. But the majority of the cricket we play in red ball cricket is about occupation of the crease and having the patience and the ability to absorb some pressure and score your runs later on when you've ground the opposition down. And I would imagine it's also a case of, of being able to then look at particular players and talk to them and say, you've done it before, you know, you can do this again. I think in particular, you're talking there about scoring runs at the end of innings. The way Ricardo Vasconcelos finished the game against um, Glamorgan with that, that big 100 win on, I got 180 not out and really kicked on in the second half. And then perhaps at, at, almost at the other end of the scale, you think of um, Rob Keogh's innings out from 99 against Surrey to win the match, which was a, an innings of terrific patience. So again, you've got those examples that you can go back to the players and say, yeah, you've done it. You know what needs to be done. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yes, I've scored 40 first class hundreds, but that doesn't mean anything to, the, to those players. You know, it's my role, it's my job in my role to be there to support and improve the players I'm working with. That's all that really matters. Um, I've got the knowledge of how it worked for me, but I also exactly hear what you're saying. I need to understand the type of batter I'm working with, what their mentality to batting in red ball cricket is, what their um, past performances, positive past performances have been like, um, and getting them to a stage mentally where they're comfortable with their game and relatively confident that every time they go out to bat, they've got a method to deal with whatever's out there in the middle. Let's talk a bit about white ball cricket, because it, it seems to me that whenever you watch a T20 game from anywhere in the world, and we're able to do that now, and, and follow the various tournaments, almost every match that you watch, there seems to be a batsman, a batter doing something different, something that you haven't seen before, a new, a new little skill, a new tactic. How easy is it to get as a coach to keep up with that? I think what it is, it, it's obviously easier to be reactive, to see someone do it once and then think, right, I think there's players in our uh, setup that are going to be able to do that. You can break things down like square ball wicket, sort of funky shots are, are more likely to be played by those shorter stature players that are good square ball wicket. Um, the bigger hitters that have long levers, they're the ones that you'd still encourage to hit down the ground and be more aggressive and brutal in the V, as it were. Um, I don't actually think, I mean, you can brainstorm, you can sit around the table and you can think, right, how can we invent a shot? I don't know if it's as, as easy as that. I think it's more, you can stumble across these things. And I think we see a lot of that, where batters go out and they just get themselves into a position at the crease, play a shot and think that might work. Now that could happen in training, and I would suggest it would do, and then be practiced before it then is taken out into the middle. But unless you have, you, you, you see a batter do it, or maybe from the batsman's perspective, a batter feels it and does it, it's very difficult to invent these shots in a classroom. Um, I think the, the, the big thing for me would be a lot of the practice I've brought in this winter is to try and hit the same ball, both score both sides of the wicket, which then gives the batter an opportunity to work out how I can hit the bowler's best ball onto the leg side, maybe just to keep the scoreboard ticking or for a boundary, and what position do I need to get myself in to score on the offside, again, to keep the scoreboard ticking into pockets for twos or for boundaries as well. So I think you can work like that as a batting group, and as a coach, you're going to encourage in white ball cricket your players to hit to score off the best ball, maybe as defending for one, or can I hit that same ball there, there, maybe there and there? 
And that will all come down to the strengths of the player as well. Yes, behind the scenes, the shorter stature player that I've just been describing, who scores very well square of the wicket and behind square, will be working really hard on bombing the ball back down the ground straight. But ultimately, his bread and butter will be in these areas he's strong in. So let's just make sure that you're 100% confident that you can do that. Just go back for a second to your own playing career. Um, we say obviously you had a long career with, with Leicestershire and with Worcestershire in the county game. What, who were the players that, perhaps as a young cricketer coming in and starting off, that you found that you learned the most from? And also, we've said about the fact that you've been able to coach all around the world. Who were the coaches that you've perhaps thought, yeah, he's, he's, he knows what it's about and I can pick up some stuff, I can, I can sort of tap into to his knowledge and his methods? Yeah. Uh, I think going back as a player, um, as a boy, or watching cricket at Grace Road with my dad, um, I was just, I, I was absolutely devastated I wasn't a left-hander because I grew up watching David Gow play at Grace Road. And I just loved the way he used elegance and confidence. It was how the game should be played for me. It was in really no rush. Um, I was completely the other end of the scale as a batsman compared to him. Right-handed, a little bit nuggety, uh, punchy sort of player where he was so flu fluid and elegant. Um, and, I, and I loved, I can always remember, I know the shot through backward point sort of gully area that was his downfall a lot of the time, but I'm sure would have, he would have scored a lot of runs from. Two things that stand out were, his first ball in Test cricket, he hit for four, which I can remember the shot, the pull shot. John Harlett said, oh, what a princely yeah. entry. <laughs> yeah. um, I believe it was against India, wasn't it? Pakistan. Pakistan. Was it? Who's the bowler? Do you know? The Arka Ali, I think. Right, there we go. Brilliant from, you. Brilliant from you. And, uh, but I can remember the shot, and I can also remember thinking how the ball, when he plays, just stays on the bat for a bit longer than anybody else. When a lot of other batters, what I mean by that, they hit the ball, it's hit hard and a bit stabby. And he just sort of, the ball just stayed on the bat and then it left it and went like a rocket in all different directions. So I love watching him play. Um, and then obviously Tendorka came on the scene probably in, in, in the period where I was really starting to, you know, trying to turn it on as a pro. Um, and to watch him bat just with the absolute perfect technique was amazing. Again, another left-hander then, Lara sort of took the world by storm and something I, I always felt, I would know Brian Lara by any stretch of the imagination, but something I brought into my one day game was his high back lift and, and understanding that I didn't have to change the way I played as a batter, but to generate more power as a young man, I, if I picked the bat up higher, would that work for me? And it actually did. I hit sweepers harder um, and started to score more heavily in one day cricket. So there were the little things where I can look back and think certain players in that era helped me. Um, coaches wise, my, my, school, my, my primary school teacher, George Sim, got me into competitive cricket. Up until the age of 10, I'd flirted with it a little bit. I'd gone to watch dad play played in the yard at home uh, on the village green, like you all do at that, at that age. And then um, he set up a six-a-side team. So we went into inner city, because I was in a village at the time. We played six-a-side competition through the summer and got a real taste for competitive cricket, how a game actually is structured and put together. And then Ken Higgs started to be um, more of a mentor and coach of mine at Grace Road from sort of the age of 11, 12, through until I was 17. Um, and Higgy was brilliant because he was very much straight down the line. Just when at that age I was getting a, a, it was a bit fluffy around the edges. My dad didn't want to really upset me too much by telling me the truth. Um, my mates wouldn't tell me because they're your peers and you want to support each other. Higgy, Higgy was the one that would just say, he would. told me how it, <laughs> exactly how it was, you know, um, and had a brilliant way of doing it. It never upset me. But, but I, I knew he was that type of person. Uh, and then Jack Birkinshaw then joined the, the county at Leicestershire where I was still playing then um, as head coach. And what I loved about Berkey was he would sort of tell you what he would expect from you uh, and manage you as a player in that way. He wasn't necessarily a technical coach for me. Mm -hmm. I think where we were lucky and going back to your question about having success as a team, the players I think we coached helped coach each other and this is something that maybe I'd forgotten to mention then. 
you can be pulled up by your peers. This isn't good enough. When you play well, you play straighter through mid on rather than trying to hit it and get glory through mid wicket. Berkey was very much a, a good manager for me, told me exactly what he expected. And I think his method of allowing me to go away and work out how I was going to deliver that made me a better player. Um, because at 19, I played for England in the 19s, but was I really going to make it? it the jury was probably still out then as well. Um, and then I moved to Worcestershire with Tom Moody as a head coach. I moved to Worcestershire because I loved the idea of batting four behind Graham Hick. And Tom as a coach, had had so much success with the Australian side and was doing good things at Worcester. Um, and when I landed down at New Road, Tom was very much, again, maybe the next level up of coach. Not that the other two weren't or three weren't good enough, but for me at my stage of my career at the age of 29, 30, it was more, I felt more, he's more of a mature adult type of coach for me. Um, nurtured me a little bit but was more wanting to know my thoughts. And with my knowledge I've got as a 30 year old first class cricketer, how I feel I can impact on the game, um, which was again, a good move for me because of the way to runs I scored for Worcestershire in that 10 years. Uh, and then sort of finally, I suppose going back to your question about who I've worked with, um, working with John Bracewell, working with uh, Dipak Patel at, at, at CD, working with um, Graham Ford and now working with John and a younger team. What I've done there is I've gone from um, John Bracewell, who was a quite an abrasive type, type of character in, in coaching, again, real hard sort of talking guy, to Graham Ford, who was a little bit more like, he's just brilliant with individuals, he gets the best out of players to, to the degree where you might not be playing that well, but he'll make you believe you are. Um, and and to John now, who I've only spent two or three months with, but again, it's a young coaching team. I actually take the, the average age of unfortunately by quite some. But again, for me, it's about now ideal, I think, because I've been out of County Creek for six years to come into an environment with young coaches that have been involved in County Cricket for that length of time. It's like a, um, it's like got me involved. It's like a, a quick introduction, rapid fire through. This is how we do stuff in county cricket now. You build that into what you learn when you're as a player, and I think it's holding me in good stead. And finally, Ben, I have to ask you this because you were once introduced, I think, on this ground as Corby Bourne Ben Smith, just yeah. to sort of give a bit of a local connection. Yeah. How does it feel to be back with your native county? Yeah, no, well, no, uh, first impressions have been. Brilliant for me. I mean, they've been so welcoming, the players and the support staff and themselves. And, it, and it's, again, going back to the first question, what brought me here? I've missed county cricket massively. I've got a huge love of the game. Um, and I've just developed more recently in my coaching career that, that passion for developing players and bringing players through. And it might not just be on the field all the time. It might just be them off the field. You know, it might just be how they live their lives. And, and what, one thing it really... I really enjoy about, and, and I've enjoyed about getting back to Northamptonshire, at the place of my birth, is I just feel it's great to have relationships and build relationships and hopefully some real long-term relationships and friends, you know, for the years to come. 